that tunnels through the Rockies. An epic byway connecting two great national parks. A route that's beckoned a century of challenges. A mountain pass that takes an army to keep clear. And a road that reveals some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. So come on along for the ride. Now, Mountain Roads on Modern Marvels. In Northern California, Donner Pass traverses the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Infamous for a dark chapter in its history, this scenic path has long served as a vital artery, allowing men, machinery, goods, and information to pass from the Great Plains to the Pacific Ocean. The historic passage is part of I-80, a transcontinental superhighway that connects New Jersey with California. The Donner section of I-80 plays a critical role by maintaining the flow of interstate commerce. And as with most mountain roads, building it was just the first of many challenges. Donner Pass, uh, as formidable as it was for the Donner Party uh, back in the 1800s, it can still be that deadly today. Each year, an average of 42 feet of snow falls here. But severe storms can dump as much as 20 feet in a matter of days. Visiting motorists are often unaccustomed to the challenges of driving here. A family vacation can quickly turn into a life-threatening ordeal. The technological advances and comforts integrated into modern vehicles may only mask the dangers. The trouble with most vehicles they manufacture nowadays is they're more comfortable than sitting in your chair in your front room. And they've got heated seats, they've got cruise control, they've got all the uh, comforts of uh, video and, and stereo uh, equipment. And what that does is distract people from what's happening to the road surface. When that happens, cars can crash or go over the side of the road. Caltrans, short for the California Department of Transportation, keeps a watchful eye and offers a helping hand. 10-4. Yeah, we got someone coming to help you out. Okay, once we get these chains on, we should be all right yeah. just to pull it out. Okay, Doug. Thanks. On this mountain road, conditions can quickly go from bad to worse. You get ice. Lots of snow, whiteouts where you can't see. Traffic that assumes they can do whatever they'd like. Uh, it gets to be real difficult out here, especially in heavy traffic when a good storm's going. Hey, buddy. Here. This is what you're going to want to do. Throw this over like so. Severe storms also impact the economy. Local skiing and gambling are heavily dependent on the traffic that flows through I-80. Every hour the route is closed, costs American businesses about a million dollars from lost tourism, reduced productivity, and the delay of time-sensitive deliveries. R2 westbound state line to Nyack. Truck train requirements are minimum King Vale clear. Keeping I-80 open and safe is the mission of Caltrans. Kingvale Communication Center acts as headquarters. Ground zero for collecting information and coordinating the response. Its direct feed satellite downloads real-time data on the current snowfall and road conditions. This is our uh, troop system, our California Highway Internet Reporting Program. And what that does is that it gives real-time internet access to the public as to what's going on on Highway 80 regarding the train control from point A to point B. At the first sign of a storm, trucks with computer-controlled signs are dispatched to key intersections to further update drivers. This is a TMT truck, which stands for Traffic Management Truck. It has a computerized sign that notifies the public of how we program it, what the road conditions are, emergencies ahead, uh, slippery roads, accidents, so it's a good safety tool. King Vale 720. 
continually get traffic counts throughout the area to find out what type of volume of traffic we're going to have, what to expect if we have an accident or we're holding traffic. So you're always, always knowing what your traffic volume is at all times. Kingvale is one of four Caltrans mini cities of mechanics, technicians, drivers, and support personnel that keeps I-80 humming. We have 40 pieces of snow removal equipment, and with the support people, mechanics, dispatchers, cooks, uh, supervision, in a major storm we'll have 80 to 90 people working out of this one station. Clearing the highway as quickly as possible is the main goal of the snow removal team. Snow graders or snow plows move out first, followed by powerful snow blowers. In the early 1990s, the snow plow fleet was modernized, dramatically increasing efficiency. Before, if we plowed with a grader, we would average maybe six, seven miles an hour. Well, now, 15 to 18 miles an hour, uh, we can operate these graders. The largest blower we had up here would handle about 3,000 tons an hour. We picked up a blower that averages now 5,000 tons an hour. Those units have revolutionized the way we do business on the summit as far as snow removal. They flat uh, move the snow out. The snow plows are equipped with blades made of extra hard carbide. Even so, grinding against asphalt and concrete quickly wears them out. They can be changed once a day or they can, be, they can last two or three days depending on the type of snow we have and the, the amount the equipment is used. When stalled vehicles block the road and prevent snow plows from operating, the mighty H2 tow truck comes to the rescue. Mainly we use it to push big rigs up the hill. We've got a 7% grade out here that gets pretty icy. And when they can't get traction, we'll get behind them and push them push an enormous weight, like an 80,000 pound FedEx truck struggling to get traction up a slippery, steep grade. Perhaps the most perilous situation is a whiteout. But newly developed technology helps drivers to see into the darkness. It navigates just like an airplane would on instruments. The operator of the truck operates it using a screen that shows him where he is in the road. It's also equipped with forward and rear emitting radar sensors that show any uh, obstructions that uh, might be in the highway. Drivers stay on track with magnet technology. A view screen in the truck responds to magnets that have been placed in the center of the highway. By keeping the red dots between the white lines, the drivers stay centered on the road, even in zero visibility conditions. There are some areas that are real scary in the whiteout because they're uh, banked curves and steep downgrades, but it's more exciting than it is scary because you're in this big truck, you got radio contact, you're talking to the people in front of you, they're letting you know if there's any cars in the bank, anybody on foot you have to watch out for, and it's exciting, it's fun. It wasn't always fun. The pioneers who gave the name and their lives to this mountain pass had only the crudest means of overcoming the forces of nature. In the mid-1800s, Countless wagon trains made their way west to California through this narrow passage in the Sierras. This huge set of mountains that are covered with outcrops of granite have high and low points. And when immigrants would want to come over, they would look for some lower points. This is one of the lower points in the middle of this huge range. But at over 7,000 feet elevation, low is a relative term. On October 31st, 1846, the 87 men, women, and children of the Donner Party reached the base of the summit. They'd begun their trek from the Midwest late in the season and arrived one day too late. That night, a massive snowfall blocked the passage with drifts 20 feet high. They sent a few men out over the mountains trying to get down to Sutter's Ford and other locations and come back with supplies. But they weren't going to get the whole group out until the next spring. By that time, almost half the party had died. The ordeal would claim 34 lives. Some survivors warded off starvation by resorting to cannibalism. 
The case of the Donner Party exemplifies the importance of mountain roads. If there had been a road through there at the time, and if they'd exercised a little bit more caution, they might have gotten through uh, successfully. But not even tragedy could diminish the importance of the newly named Donner Pass, which was to play a still more significant role in Western history. Three years after the Donner tragedy, Wells Fargo completed a stagecoach road through the passage. As you start getting people who are coming out the Oregon Trail and decided to detour to California, they're going to try to widen this out. They're going to be cutting down trees. They're going to be using the stumps to uh, winch up their wagons, and this eventually gets wider and wider. In the 1860s, thousands of Chinese immigrants carved a passageway through the mountains. Finally, in 1869, the first transcontinental railroad connected California with the East Coast. It moved through Donner Pass. Early in the 20th century, a route parallel to the rail line was cleared to make way for a new invention, the automobile. In 1913, workers completed the Lincoln Highway, a gravel road that was nonetheless the nation's first transcontinental highway. Its route was over Donner Pass. People wanted a route across the country where they could control their own pace and find their way. It's kind of an adventure. In the 1950s, Interstate 80 replaced the Lincoln Highway. Four lanes gave way to eight. Turns were smoothly banked. The latest long-lasting mixture of asphalt was laid over the gravel. The creation of I-80 through Donner Pass exemplifies how road building technology and the administrative and economic might of the interstate highway system eventually conquered obstacles that had long challenged American overland travel. This happened in many places throughout America. I-70 in Colorado is yet another mountain superhighway. It's here that the Rockies' rugged terrain would give way to the construction of a monumental tunnel. The annual cost of Caltrans snow clearing personnel and equipment in the Donner Pass region exceeds six million dollars. Mountain roads will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Mountain Roads on Modern Marvels. High in the Rocky Mountains, 60 miles west of Denver, stands one of the great links in the transportation chain that connects the regions of the United States. Eisenhower Tunnel is a four-lane traffic tunnel at 11,000 feet above sea level. It transverses the Great Divide of the Rocky Mountains. It changed the face of Colorado. Both commercially and the ski industry have all bloomed since it opened 32 years ago. Eisenhower is the highest vehicular tunnel in the world, and it was one of the most difficult to design and construct. The tunnel was the final link in I-70, a highway that stretches all the way from Maryland to Utah. The road was begun on the East Coast during the 1930s, and expanded west to Colorado over the next two decades. In 1957, workers expanded the road even further west to Utah. Perhaps the most monumental achievement in I-70's history was the construction of Colorado's 1.6-mile Eisenhower Tunnel. Each day, 29,000 vehicles pass through. Previously, these motorists would have been forced to take the old Loveland Pass, a route that's a thousand feet higher and adds an hour and a half to each round trip. The Eisenhower Tunnel, which was designed to bypass a narrow, circuitous, winding, relatively dangerous and hard to keep open roadway, was a, a major technological fix to a long-standing problem. Charles Robinson and Richard Eccles are two of the men responsible for this unique feat of construction. Great fun. Great fun. Uh -huh. What dirty, nasty old hole in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they all? This area, adjacent to Loveland Pass, was chosen back in the 1960s after extensive scouting and geological investigation. There were going to be many challenges. Well, we knew it was going to be ugly. <laughs> this 
tunnel goes through a major, what they call the Love and Birth and Pass Fault Zone, or Shear Zone, and that's bad rock. As a result, engineers realized that a single four-lane tunnel was impractical. To reduce the stress, they came up with a design featuring a pair of two-lane tunnels. In March of 1968, construction began on the westbound board. They would excavate to a height of 48 feet and a width of 40 feet, the largest bore ever attempted in the United States. When tunnels are built today, giant custom-made boring machines drill tunnel-sized holes with relative ease. But in the 1960s, drilling and blasting was the only way. Setting charges was a dirty, dangerous, and agonizingly slow process. They were drilling around 12 to 15 feet, loading it with powder, blowing it out, then they would muck all that material out, and then the shield would go ahead again. After workers blasted and removed a section of rock, large steel supports were positioned around the excavation. This was known as the shield. The blue structures there in the model are the arch ribs, the steel arch support ribs that were used to support the mountain as we went through it. And they were spaced anywhere from three feet to one foot. In addition, steel reinforcing bars were inserted. All told, 10,000 tons of steel were used to keep the mountain from collapsing in on itself. An 800-foot long stretch of the tunnel ran through a fault, the most unstable area within the mountain. Engineers and geologists devised a plan to deal with this problem. They came up with what we call the multi-drift system, a drift being a smaller tunnel that with steel and concrete reinforces what is today's present tunnel. To support this unstable area, a series of smaller tunnels, or drifts, was bored out by drilling and blasting. Each drift measured approximately nine feet square and was filled with concrete. At the project's peak, 1,140 people labored in three shifts, 24 hours a day, six days a week. The work was exhausting, unending, and sometimes deadly. When you're underground, it's very dangerous because you're working in a very small, confined area. You have lots of equipment. It's dark, it's muddy, it's noisy. Some of the people, too, I think, were backed over by cement trucks, and one fell to his death. Eventually, 2.5 million cubic yards of rock were excavated at a cost of seven lives. In 1973, three years behind schedule and 100% over budget, the westbound tunnel was finally completed. Six years later, in 1979, the eastbound passage followed suit. Total cost, $262 million. The 10 million cars that pass through the tunnels each year are exposed to but a small portion of the complex. Motorists can't see the three cross passages that connect the tunnels at 2,000 foot intervals. These passages give maintenance workers access to the entire facility and provide for evacuation in case of emergency. We monitor traffic through 22 monitor zones, 11 in each bore, and we're trying to identify any problems we might have. It could be a stalled vehicle, or in worst case scenario, a tunnel fire. What about your overheated vehicle? In a crisis, Eisenhower can be completely self-sufficient. The complex maintains its own fire trucks, ready to respond on a moment's notice. Each tunnel has its own electrical system drawing from the power grid. Each also has a set of backup generators and banks of batteries in case of a power failure. This is the uh, local control board for the emergency generator. It runs on natural gas. It'll provide our power to tunnel lighting, minimal lighting, building lighting, and minimal ventilation. As an additional fail-safe, if one tunnel had to be closed, the second could be converted to handle two-way traffic. 
One of the biggest concerns with long car tunnels at high altitude is the buildup of carbon monoxide. The Eisenhower ventilation system is elaborate and frequently adjusted as the density of traffic changes. Exhaust ducts carrying fresh air run through the tunnels above the ceiling. We're walking right over the tunnel right now into the North Tunnel. And these are the supply ducts. And actually the the output of the of the ventilation is behind us, and it what it does is it blows air all the way to the center of the tunnel. 28 giant fans, each more than 10 feet wide, are capable of moving over a million cubic feet of air every two minutes. Ventilation stacks tower three stories above the control centers. Ultimately, they keep everyone, motorists and tunnel workers, breathing safely. For a quarter of a century, the Eisenhower Tunnel and I-70 have helped motorists get to their destinations more easily and quickly. But not all mountain roads are meant for utilitarian purposes. Montana's Going to the Sun Road is a destination unto itself, allowing travelers to go where few had ever ventured. During construction of the Eisenhower Tunnel, workers detonated anywhere from 75 to 220 pounds of explosives, depending on the density of the rock, to gain a four-foot advance. Mountain roads will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Mountain Roads on Modern Marvels. Glacier National Park in northwestern Montana is one of the crown jewels of America's park system. Its 1.2 million acres contain some of the most breathtaking scenery on Earth. Aside from a few town sites at its borders, this is a land that time forgot. Human activity is all but invisible among the massive glacial lakes, windswept alpine tundra, and sweeping evergreen forests. There is but one major sign of man in this wilderness. The spectacular going to the sun road. Two narrow lanes that weave for 52 miles through seemingly impassable terrain. It goes from 3,000 feet to the top of Logan Pass, which makes you feel like you're on top of the world. You kind of look out the window and you really are awed by the scenery that you see. It's a, it's a beautiful scene that you can drive in your own personal car and go look at. Early in the 20th century, a debate raged within the Department of the Interior over whether or not to allow roads in America's national parks. The final decision was that these big western parks, such as Glacier, were going to have probably one major road, and that major road should also be built to the highest possible standards. Glacier's Trans Mountain Highway would arguably be the most difficult road ever attempted in American history. It would traverse dense wilderness and cross the Continental Divide at an elevation of 6,646 feet. Beginning in September 1924, surveyor Frank Kittredge and his team of 32 men battled the elements to determine the best possible paths through ice and rock. They worked in September, October, and November. There was fog, there was snow, there was sleet, there was hail. And each day they had to climb higher and higher and higher. They had to rappel off of cliffs in order to find the survey places where they wanted to put in the stakes. Despite the rugged terrain, Kittredge envisioned a road that would nonetheless create a gentle riding experience filled with sweeping vistas. But building his road in the middle of the wilderness with minimal environmental impact would be a major challenge. Initially, all of the materials that they needed had to be brought up on horseback. Whatever equipment they could get up is what they had to use. You had picks, you had crowbars, and you had shovels that they used. At first, the decidedly low-tech operation relied on backbreaking labor. At the peak of construction in the late 1920s, 300 men housed in seven camps cleared the route. It was like a camping experience. They were gone up here for the whole season and sometimes into some pretty miserable weather when winter approached. 
workers detonated over 250 tons of explosives to excavate passages with a pound of dynamite for each cubic yard of material blasted. Setting the charges required a combination of steady nerves and acrobatic daring. The road is cut right out of the side of a mountain, and up here in the high country, there are very steep cliffs, many of them 100 feet, maybe two, 300 feet, sheer cliffs. And what the road workers had to do is they had to rappel down, and then they would set their dynamite charges, and then they would have to get out of the way. Boulders as large as two tons required six men with huge crowbars to move them laid 24-inch gauge track so the gas locomotives could carry loads of supplies to and debris from the ever-moving scene of construction. But it wasn't just men who built the road. Wherever accessibility permitted, 20th century technology joined them. That included bulldozers, steam shovels, and cranes. Nonetheless, stonemasons gave the retaining walls a handcrafted look, building them out of limestone and argillite. In 1933, the Going to the Sun Road was completed. It immediately became a major attraction. Visitors were thrilled by the views, and local businesses were boosted by an infusion of tourist dollars. The road's popularity continues to this day. But for the National Park Service, the task has now become how to best mix the old with the new. There's a challenge in managing mountain roads that are, on the one hand, historic, and on the other hand, fulfilling contemporary uses. How do we preserve this experience of driving the going to the sun road as if you were driving it in 1933 with the pressures that we have today to adapt to contemporary design standards? A major effort is currently underway to restore and rebuild Glacier's 70-year-old retaining walls to their original functionality and beauty. As the project begins on a particular section, workers install steel beams to shore up the road and prevent collapse. Then the men can safely reconstruct the retaining walls. Here you see we have some pretty massive rebar that's been drilled into this historic portion of the road. Beyond there, we have the, the new concrete core that'll get a stone veneer over it, and using native stone, make it look like the original construction. Once the road's brought up to grade and all this is filled in, now this wall is footed, where originally, during the original construction, it had no concrete footing at all. The goal of the caretakers of the Going to the Sun Road is to maintain the structural integrity and beauty of this beloved road for future generations. And just as the going to the sun opened up scenic wonders of the West, a few years after its completion, another major mountain road would reveal the American Southeast. The going to the sun road handled about 40,000 cars in 1934, the year it officially opened. Today, it carries 500,000 cars yearly. Mountain Roads will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Mountain Roads on Modern Marvels. The world's largest rural parkway runs for an astonishing 469 miles through one of America's most scenic regions. The Shenandoah National Park in Virginia and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina and Tennessee are connected by an intricately landscaped passage the Blue Ridge Parkway. Parkways are roads that traverse parks or scenic areas and are largely designed for recreational motoring. It's not getting there from point A to point B quickly, it is the enjoyment of the drive itself. This mountain road passes through an ever-changing natural world. One of the really interesting things about the parkway is the ephemeral nature of the parkway. The fog today is a great example of that, just as the seasons are as well. In the spring, with the coming out of the trees and the shrubs uh, and the azaleas, all the native plants, following through the summer with the bright greens and into the fall with the wonderful colors that we have. Since the 1950s, the Blue Ridge Parkway has reigned as the single most visited feature in the entire national park system. 
the parkway goes through what appears to be a pristine, undisturbed landscape, a place where the trappings of our modern lives have not entered. The Blue Ridge Parkway was intended as much to celebrate the, the disappearing cultural landscape of the Appalachians as it was to celebrate the often destroyed and recovering natural landscape of the Appalachians. In the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt backed the proposed road as a way to generate large numbers of public works jobs for people affected by the Great Depression. Roosevelt used funds from the National Industrial Recovery Act to actually authorize the beginning of the construction. And so on September the 11th, 1935, construction began on what would uh, ultimately become the longest rural parkway in this country. While the Federal Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, lined up much of the manpower, these men were actually hired and paid directly by private industry under the auspices of the Federal Highway Administration and the National Park Service. Contractors formed construction gangs. The road was divided into 40 sections of 10 to 15 miles each. Work began on several sections at once with priority given to areas where jobs were most desperately needed. Most of the early road clearing and tunnel digging was done with picks and shovels and saws. Once paths were cleared, machinery aided the effort. There were dozers, there was heavy equipment, there were dump trucks, and they used all of that because you couldn't do a project of this size by hand. The technology was, was a product of whatever the time was and that, that changed over the 50 years in which the parkway was built. A young landscape architect named Stanley Abbott was put in charge of the design. Abbott wanted the entire parkway to showcase beautiful views and he hiked through many miles of isolated countryside to choose the best route. There weren't many roads, certainly, that, that came through the mountains, and so there was a lot of field work going from place to place, looking for, for what might provide promising overlooks or, or great views of, of scenery. Unlike many earlier roads, the Blue Ridge would provide motorists with comfortable driving conditions and compelling scenery. In the Appalachian region, many of the mountain roads went from valleys up, up the mountainside, up into a community uh, that would have been at a higher elevation. These roads were frequently very difficult to drive. The Blue Ridge Parkway, by contrast, uh, goes along the ridge tops through most of its length, especially in North Carolina. When you had a ridge that ran perpendicular to the main ridge and you were going to have to either cut through that ridge or go through with the tunnel, it really preserved the landscape so that you didn't have these massive cuts and fills. The parkway's 26 tunnels were created using the technology of the day, drilling boreholes and then blasting through rock with dynamite. Many of the nearly 170 bridges were built utilizing an arch design, using natural stone excavated from the area. Bridges were used so that there wouldn't be so much cut and fill uh, in places where you really wanted to preserve the environment. Designers and builders aimed for a natural, handcrafted look. Structures along the route were finished with facings of local stone, giving the appearance that they dated from a pre-concrete era. A lot of that stonework was done by sort of old world artisans, stone masons who were, who were brought over from, from Italy and from Spain. And so a lot of that work was done by, by people who were, were very highly skilled. World War II interrupted construction on the Blue Ridge Parkway. After the war, progress resumed slowly, yet steadily. By 1968, only one seven-mile link at Grandfather Mountain was still missing. But North Carolina's Grandfather Mountain was owned by a man named Hugh Morton. Smart, determined, and wealthy, Morton fought the government for decades over the environmental impact the road would have on his mountain. It appeared that Morton and the government were at a permanent impasse. Then, in the 1980s, the conflict was resolved by an engineering marvel, the Lynn Cove Viaduct. What's amazing about the Lynn Cove Viaduct is how it actually appears to leave the mountain, float around the boulders, and then come back into the mountain. And that was the whole idea behind the Lynn Cove Viaduct, is how do you build a road around a boulder field as unique as this boulder field is? 
All viaducts carry roads over and above something. Designed with software that had only recently been devised, Lynn Cove is an elaborate double S-curve elevated bridge that skirts the side of the mountain rather than cutting into it. The viaduct was built using a so-called progressive segmental construction technique. This was a first for an American bridge. Abutments were built to tie the bridge into the landscape. Then, segments of the bridge were added one by one, each cantilevered out, until they reached the next support pier. The segments were epoxied together and then secured by wires that were tightened after the epoxy had hardened. Eventually, 153 segments joined to complete the 1,300-foot-long span. The Lincoln Viaduct is clearly one of the most spectacular engineering accomplishments of the last quarter of the 20th century. Yet, the entire reason to employ this complex technology and sophisticated and expensive uh, construction process was to construct a roadway that would lie lightly on the land. In 1987, 52 years after construction had begun, the Blue Ridge Parkway was completed. To the millions of motorists who have traveled the parkway over the years, its serenity has provided relief from the fast pace of modern life. But on one mountain road, top speed is everything. It's a testing ground where the winner becomes king of the mountain. To give motorists plenty of sightseeing opportunities, the Blue Ridge Parkway was constructed with more than 250 overlooks and parking areas. Mountain roads will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Mountain Roads on Modern Marvels. For the most part, mountain roads afford motorists an opportunity to observe the interplay between natural and man-made wonders. For motorists traveling up to Pikes Peak outside of Colorado Springs, Colorado, this is certainly true. You don't have to be a mountain climber. You don't have to even be in shape. Uh, you can get in your car and you can get to over 14,000 feet. More precisely, at an elevation of 14,110 feet, this is the highest summit road anywhere in the United States. But over the last century, the road up to Pikes Peak has also inspired the dreams of speed demons from all over the world, as the road has become America's highest test track. Every summer since 1916, this peaceful land has given way to the roar of motorcycles, the rumble of cars, the screech of diesel trucks, vehicles of every type competing in the race to the clouds. The world's finest drivers come to test themselves and their vehicles at Pikes Peak. winners came in with times of around 20 minutes. As car technology improved, so did the records. These days, they're cut in half. New Zealander Rod Millet drove a souped-up Toyota Celica to the top and achieved record speed several times during the 1990s. His best effort was a time of 10 minutes and 4 seconds. This is a race against the clock but it's also a race against the mountain and, and to win you have to get to the top of the mountain. And this place will throw weather at you, it'll throw changes in the character of the road. But the mountain's got its own mystique. At speeds that can exceed 120 miles per hour, around blind curves and mostly on loose gravel, each driver has the road to himself as he aims for the fastest time against all comers. The course's 12-plus miles feature a stomach-churning 156 turns. The mountain's steep pitch, mostly gravel surface, and high elevation all present problems that have led to automotive innovations. From 1954 to 2004, General Motors operated the Pikes Peak Vehicle Test Headquarters. One of the big problems that we have on Pikes Peak is fluids that boil at 14,000 feet. As an example, your brake fluid that you would have in your everyday car 10 years ago, when you got to the top of Pikes Peak, would literally be boiling. 
And so they develop new technologies and lubricants and brake fluids and transmission fluids that makes it safer for the everyday public and their personal vehicles. Because of the high altitude, unrelenting pressure can cause an engine's combustion chamber to malfunction. That's why Shell Oil tested its special Rotella T-Oil formula here on a Freightliner truck. Over the course of the many years of the race, other automotive innovations have been made. These have included the development of better tires and better suspensions. Manufacturers have tested all-wheel drive, fuel injection, turbocharging, and even alternative fuel systems on the mountain. Long before car manufacturers and race car drivers were trying to make a name for themselves here, an explorer, Lieutenant Zebulon Pike, earned the distinction of having the mountain named after him. In 1806, he led an expedition surveying the farthest reaches of the Louisiana Purchase, using the mountain as a guide. It soon became a national landmark. It was the identifying feature for Colorado. And so nationally, even internationally, the entire state of Colorado really was known as the Pikes Peak region. In 1889, in order to take tourists to the summit, Workers built a carriage road using picks and shovels and mules and wagons. In 1891, a nine-mile-long steam-powered cog railroad was added. Before the Pikes Peak Highway, you had the cog, and people had to pay dearly to, uh, to take that ride. Or you could ride on a mule train or hike yourself. Then in the early 1900s, Spencer Penrose, a wealthy mining entrepreneur, decided to develop the area for tourism with a grand European-style hotel and an exhilarating ride up to the top of Pikes Peak. A new road would have to be built. The construction at that time in 1915, 1916 would have been largely uh, a result of draft animals, horses, and manpower. Very few machines were in involved in the construction of the road. Uh, perhaps some drills and dynamiting, but really it was, a, it was hard physical labor. The road was completed on August 1st, 1916. It was an immediate success. To drive a road that went nowhere except up and down the mountain, tourists were willing to pay what was then the exorbitant toll of $2.50 per car. Then Penrose came up with an even better idea. 1916, he wanted to advertise the highway by having a race on it, and then in turn, that gives something for people to do, and then hopefully they'll come stay in this hotel. Today, over 300,000 vehicles travel the Pikes Peak Road annually. But the gravel from the road is running off and accumulating in gullies and streams. This process, called sedimentation, is choking surrounding trees and marshes. To deal with this problem, the city of Colorado Springs is paving the entire roadway, a near decade-long project due for completion in 2010. We're now standing at the spot where we started the construction in 2001. I'm on the shoulder of the road, and as you can see, this is an example of the Pikes Peak gravel. It's decomposed, it's weathered, it's breaking down, and it's they used to be what we would call Pikes Peak granite, natural to the mountain. And what we've done now is actually covered it with the asphalt surface. So we've hardened the surface, we've stabilized the surface, and we're going to prevent that runoff that would generate the sedimentation. Some fear that a paved road will obscure the area's history and change the unique character of the race. Others are reserving judgment. I suppose we'll have to wait and see how history judges the change to the road, but they've been adding different types of vehicles that go up the mountain. And uh, this should add a, a new perspective to uh, the challenge of the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Mountain roads have always been about change. For the past century, they have drastically altered the American landscape and opened great wildernesses to anyone with a car. These mountain roads enable us to celebrate much of what we feel is grand and good about America. Our technological expertise and at the same time our ability to meld technological expertise with a reverence for nature, which we have long prided ourselves in as Americans. The many builders of America's mountain roads have entered areas previously closed to man. Their challenge has been to maintain the delicate balance between serving and controlling nature. And time will be the ultimate judge 
of how well they've accomplished their goals. From the smallest stowaways to the big...